Chapter 119, verses 1 and 2, and we discussed sessions ago about, about it. How we begin. Fortunate or praiseworthy is a person who is in who goes in the pure path that walks in the instruction, walks in the instruction of God and God's Torah. So I was telling you, I think maybe even our first lecture when we were doing when we first started doing Psalms um, a couple of weeks ago was telling you the interpretation of the Malbim that um, it was a, that we're talking against the philosophers that the Torah God's instruction does not blow in the wind doesn't depend on whether it's uh, it gives a person some type of material benefit but it's the will of God and in that sense it's really the ultimate truth and the ultimate good and it doesn't waver from side to side that's what it means a pure path what persons it's really really should be the meaning of a path if you're on a path you don't veering off a path the whole idea of a path is you stay on it yeah it's true you may eventually get to a curve and then you have to decide if you're going to go on another path that's like another path you're on a path you then you, you the point person of the path is to tell you how to go and not to go off of it right anyway so in other words well i'm also saying that the whole idea of a derek really all other paths are not really a path but certainly at Samime, Samime Dara, the, the tamimut the pure path this is one that that there's no possibility of veering off due to personal benefits due to selfish interests so what we have to take away from this is that we have to think about all our actions in terms of what does God want in this situation? What would bring, like, like Rabbi Nachman says, and you know, it says in other, a lot of other works too, it says in Chabad works also, but particularly I remember it's Rav, Rav, uh, Nachman speaking about this, is that always ask yourself, does this sanctify God's name if I'm going to do this, or do, or the opposite? Is this going to be something that will bring sanctity, which is when God gives God pleasure, or the opposite? At the same time, we have to also ask ourselves, is this something that would bring pleasure to the rabbis, to the sages of Israel particularly, or not? In other words, is this, is this in line with the tradition of Israel given to the prophets, given to the rabbis, or not? Because how do we really know? Do we know God's will? We know the word of God's will through the rabbis. Not only that, every day, how do we start our day? One of the first things we do is, is a Jew does is make, uh, no, I doesn't have to do this. Some of you may choose, so I don't know, but we make a blessing on washing the hands, right? Now, washing the hands is rabbinic. There's no biblical law you have to wash your hands in the morning. But we make the blessing that, that you have sanctified us with your commandments and you instructed us and directed us to wash the hands in the morning. But God didn't tell us. So why do we say? And the same thing with the Hanukkah candles and other commandments. We say we make a blessing and the, at the Sabbath candles once again also. We say that you sanctified us and you commanded us. But God did not. The rabbis did. So obviously the answer is, is that God has authorized the rabbis and God's will is done through the human, and through the tradition given to Moses, through, through, the, through Moses' prophecy, and then through the interpretation and articulation of, of, of the sages and the rabbis from generation to generation. And this is God's will. This is what God wants. God wants us to follow them. And so... The true pure path is to follow in the path of the sages. So there's those two points here: is the points to do to do it for the sake of God, and to follow loyally the path of the rabbis have set for us. And, and the advantage to that also is that the rabbinic path is extremely detailed. And you're able to, because really these two things go together. For example, a person may not know what God wants in a certain situation. And obviously a person has a lot. We have our own of our own self-interests and feelings. It's very hard for us sometimes to be objective and really know the right thing. 
So we can ask a rabbi, we can ask a, a Torah sage, a close colleague, something, someone that we trust, and they can tell us because they don't have that that personal interest, that personal that we have. It's not their situation. They'll be able to help us and direct us. So it's really key. In other words, in order to get to level one to do what God wants, we need the second part, which is counsel, rabbinic counsel. It's very important. And thirdly, we to, to know what is correct and what's not. This is the halacha. This is known through Jewish law, all the minutia of Jewish law. We can find an answer. We can find instruction. We can find examples of how in every particular situation in life, what is it that, that fits into God's will? How, what, what fits into God's, um, God's moral structure and God's moral instruction? <clears throat> now, interesting that the second verse, we spoke about also before, it says, fortunate and praiseworthy are those who watch and guard your testimonies with, whole, with all their heart they seek it. I was thinking that this verse may allude to the Sabbath, also other holidays, right? But the testimonies, what's the first testimony? One of the first testimonies is the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath, the, Jews, the Jewish people, the children of Israel testify that God created the world. It's one of the reasons that by the benediction, by the Kiddush, we stand. Because, in, uh, uh, because, uh, because a witness stands when he bears testimony. <clears throat> so I thought that's interesting because here in this verse it says a person who guards the testimonies. And the idea of guarding makes sense with the Sabbath. In other words, you're guarding from doing work. You have to guard yourself from all the different prohibitions, and there are a lot of them. <laughs> Of how to keep the Sabbath is uh, not an easy task. Cheyenne probably knows all about it. She's learning the laws now, probably, I assume. She knows all about it. It's, it's, there's a lot to know there. I just learned something new this past week, which uh, I should have probably known. But uh, anyway, there's so much you have to keep studying about it. There's, so, But the, my point is that the idea of us, that fortunate, ashrei, notre, a doisov, that fortunate and praiseworthy are those who guard his testimonies, I think is an allusion to the Sabbath. And then it says, with all his heart he seeks them, again is the Sabbath. In other words, a person should remember and yearn for the Sabbath all week. So why am I telling this to B'nai Noach? Uh, well, it's just, I think it's a, it's, it's a good approach to this verse, but I think there's a general idea that can be sought over here, and that is that, first of all, we discussed last time about in what way the Noahide community can connect to the idea of the Sabbath <clears throat> through the appreciation of the natural world and, uh, and not wasting it and being respectful to nature that recognizes that it belongs to God. And also, I also mentioned that also matters about adultery and so on, since it has to do with separation of species, incest particularly, obviously, as to the, God, the, the boundaries God has set in the world. In other words, basically what I'm saying is, and to a certain extent, a lot of the seven laws, in a certain sense, not as clearly as the Sabbath, but from a certain perspective, bear testimony that God created the world. Because in other words, look, the point is, when we violate these things, we're saying we're our own master, and there's no creator. Um. But when we say, no, there are boundaries, and there are things I can't cross, that's because there's another master. That's because there's a creator, and he made the laws. So in other words, for example, again, I mean, nature, the natural world and abusing it, that's, that's ob more obvious. But in terms of theft, or in terms of, as I said, adultery or incest, so it was showing that there's certain boundaries that God put in the world. And it's not up to me. I have no right to break them and make my own rules. I have to respect those boundaries that God set. And um, so in that way, it's a testimony of, of God creating the world. I guess really theft is a little bit maybe less so because it's, it's, it reflects human, human possession. Uh, murder is another one. Murder is also. Murder also reflects the fact that it's a recognition that another human being, number one, that he's a creation that God created him. And I have no right to take to take his life away. That's not that's not uh, I'm not the master over this over that. It also could be a recognition of his particular divine nature of the human being. 
And it also obviously reflects the end of creation, the sixth day in which God created man. So in that way, murder is also a certain way of respecting that and restraining oneself from that in all its different offshoots also is something that reflects that God created the world. Okay. The third verse says, and also they did not commit any injustice. They walked in his paths. So, it's interesting, Rashi says, too, an interesting point, which is, I would like, I was thinking to say a little bit something different, but Rashi is, Rashi says, again, it's interesting, the point here is that we have to have, and this is what Judaism really is all about, we have to have a complete, person must observe the Torah in its, in its, in its complete form. And that's the same goes for B'nai Noach in terms of their seven laws. You can't pick and choose. And here we see a similar idea in terms of we start this, we started the, the chapter talking about walking in God's path, studying Torah, right? Going in the Torah, the instruction of God, which is which basically it's an allusion to Torah, meditating on Torah and Torah study. Then we talked about keeping the testimonies, which has to do with the holidays and such. And then we're talking about honesty, not to commit a wrong against your fellow. And it says, and even this they didn't do. You can make a little bit of a joke about that. I mean, you know, person who's keeping the Sabbath, he's spending a ton of money on the Sabbath. He uh, may uh, start getting an inkling that maybe he should uh, overcharge his neighbor because, you know, he needs it for the Sabbath. So verse three says, no, 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 you can't do that. Don't let the other commandments act, God forbid, to, uh, to help the evil inclination. And that could happen. Because the evil inclination is very cunning. So he comes to you and he says, oh, it's a mitzvah. What do you mean? You have to have a nice Sabbath. You need it. You deserve it. These people you're, you know, overcharging. They're very, uh, maybe the person says to themselves, they're illiterate. They're not keeping the Sabbath like I am. I have a right to take more from them, et cetera, et cetera. All these different excuses that often when a person is more pious in certain areas, he could, God forbid, get arrogant. And the Eight Sahara, the evil inclination in his cunningness, in his, with, his, with his deceit and his cunning, convinces the person to do terrible wrongs in the name of, uh, you know, using the money for religious purposes. So here we're saying, so that's what it says here. No, he didn't. He didn't commit any wrong. And not only that, and he walked in his ways. But interesting, Rashi here says, even though, even though they didn't commit any wrong and harm did commit harm to other people, that's not enough. It also has to be, yes, they have to walk in God's ways. In other words, you also have to keep the commandments between man and God. It's not enough to say, as many people do say, I'm a nice guy. I'm a good person. That's enough. I don't have to do, you know. All the rest of the stuff, the rest of the stuff is, uh, you know, ritualistic things that, uh, you know, doesn't mean, doesn't make me an ethical person. No. David Amela, King David is telling us here, you didn't commit, a, you know who's praiseworthy? Someone doesn't commit a wrong, but at the same time, he walks in God's ways, meaning to say also in terms of praying to God, being connected with God, being pious in terms of keeping the other laws, whether it's Sabbath or kosher law or whatever else it may be as related to or, or sexual impurity issues, whatever may be related to more in terms of God and man and God, he keeps those two. There is also, although another way to read the words, and he's, he walked in his ways, we know that the sages say that walking in God's ways actually refers to positive acts of loving kindness. So the first part, of the, which fits perfectly, the beginning of the verse says he didn't commit a wrong to anyone. But that's not enough. He not only did not commit a wrong, but he went out of his way to seek out to do acts of kindness, to clothe the naked, to feed to feed the hungry, to console console the mourners, to protect the widow. He didn't just say, "I didn't hurt anybody." Again, this is also something you hear a lot in the world. He said, "I'm a good guy. I, I don't hurt anybody. I'm a good person." 
No, it's not just you. That that's not enough. Okay, you sit home. You don't. You mind your own business. You don't quote hurt anybody, but you don't help anybody. Your person's apathetic. The person is callous to the problems around them. This is also no good. This is not enough. So that's also why charity is really important because a lot of times it is really hard to get directly involved, and not all of us have the right personalities to get involved in and particularly today's problems are so complex you know a lot of people suffering from uh, you know different social ills whether, whether there's drug addictions or psycho mental health problems and for us to think we're just going to jump in there and you know, we're not professionals and assist them it's very difficult but we can give to organizations that do help you know and so that way we can we can help people um so that's something a person really has to do. It's not enough just to not do a wrong, but we have to at least give charity. And besides that also, anything that comes our way, if there's some way we can help, we have to help. It's a famous, uh, uh, I think one of the Rebbe's points he makes about Joseph. It's really actually is an amazing, amazing uh, uh, observation. Is is Joseph's life, and he's in the, the prison in, in Egypt, you know, in the pit, and uh, he first, he, he asks the ministers, right, the minister of, of drink and the minister, the, the baker and, the, and the, the winemaker, you say it that way. But it, it was, uh, um, he asked them, why are you so sad today? And you think about it, how did he, look, first of all, he was paying attention to them. Look, he was paying attention to their faces. He was paying attention to their moods. He cared enough. A lot of people, they don't even see you. They walk right through. You're, it's like you're not even there. They're so busy with their own needs. They don't even see other people. Like they see you, but they don't see you. They don't look look into your face and notice the, any sadness or anything. Nothing. But he didn't. He noticed. And they were non-Jews. They were Egyptian idolaters. And he, you think uh, you think he should just stay away, mind his own business. And uh, no, but he paid attention. And, and look at this interesting thing that because he paid attention and he wanted to help them and through his great wisdom, he did help them. He ended up helping the whole country. And he ended up helping the whole Jewish people. None of that would have happened if he wasn't paying attention in this small way. So you see how a small act of, of consideration can lead to 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 much bigger things pretty incredible so i think that's also a point here it's like it's not just that he that you person stays away minds their own business doesn't quote hurt anybody but we're looking around to see around us who needs help there's something i can do i mean it's such a different way to approach life you know there's two ways to go into a room you know and there are different books that you can see about this you go into a room and you see okay who in this room is influential that I should become friends with? Who, you know, who in this room do I need to impress? You know, but that's not the Torah way to approach. You know, the, not in my opinion. The right way is, um, Shem will take care of that part. Question is, who needs my help in this room? Who looks like they're lonely? They need somebody to talk to. Uh something like that who's the first person I think that might need some help it also is very helpful to us because it, it helps us realize if we're careful to look around more carefully and see what 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 bothering people we'll realize first of all we start to realize the gifts we have because we may start to notice that people have a, certain problems hangups and impoverishments that we don't and this takes a lot of wisdom this takes a lot of the uh, uh, careful meditation, but we may notice certain people, or for example, uh, I don't know, they're just grumpy and nasty. So one way we could look at it is, oh, this person's annoying. I got to stay away from this person. And that's natural. But another way to look at it is like, hey, what do you think this person went through? Or maybe to say it this way, like, isn't that sad that they're they have such a you know way of living that they're angry about life all the time? Why are they not happy? It's really sad for them that they're living like that. I wish there wouldn't be the case. Like, you know, try to be a little nice. Usually they, they might just snap at you, but it's just the point of how do you look at around the room? Do you see 
like that the, there are people that other people have problems or other people need help maybe in certain things. Sometimes we can help them, sometimes we can't. But uh, we can pray for them. We can always pray for, for other people. That's one thing. No one can say that I'm big on that. Like I don't sometimes I don't know how to help people, you know. But at least you can pray for them. You can have them in mind at least that much. For example, particularly in spiritual things, if somebody you know, doesn't, uh, he's not, he doesn't want to listen to my lectures. Okay, what can I do? He doesn't want to listen. But I could still mention them that God should open their hearts to want to hear Torah, right? And to, and to cleave the, the commandments. And so we pray so many times a day about it for ourselves, for the whole community. We have to pray for spiritual um, wisdom and inspiration, especially in such a material world. Okay, so isn't that what it means to go in God's ways? Because what does God keep himself busy with? Sustaining the world, giving life to the world, you know, bringing happiness into the world, bringing, keeping it from, <laughs> from self-destructing sometimes by sometimes doing, unfortunately having to do things in the world that are not so good in order that human beings shouldn't go completely off the deep end with uh, things that are not good. So either way, it's God's watchful eye for the for human benefit that things are happening. And so too, when we enter situations, if we could look at it in terms of what can I do. Um, anyway, it's a complex subject. Person obviously has you know social needs for themselves that have to also be considered. But uh, nevertheless, if if we can cultivate this attitude. That goes together with faith. Faith is, Hashem's giving me clearly what I have, is what Hashem wants me to have, and it must, so it's, it's good. Let me meditate on all the good that I have. And then a person looks around and sees other people that, for example, you may, like I said, you may look around the room and you see someone very grumpy, and then you think, my heavens, this person makes so much more money than me, or has this and that, and they're so unhappy. They're so unhappy. It's very, that's so sad. Maybe I can just smile at them. Maybe I can just say a smile, a happy word to them. And then if they're, if they snap at me, I don't get upset about it because I actually feel bad for them. You know, so that's, so that's one good example. All right. Anyway, let's see. We can go on now to. We'll go on to doing the hearts. I want to mention something else, just the basic idea about the, that we learned from this idea of with all their hearts, they sought it out in regard to the testimony, as I said before. So how does that relate to the Vnei Noah community? So just the idea of yearning for holiness in itself, just that idea that the Sabbath represents, you know, a time designated just for God. So what for Noahide could be the Sabbath? Well, your time of prayer. person should designate. The idea of the Sabbath is a designated time where a person's with God. A person drops, is not involved in, the, in their own needs, right? A person is a time for family, but primarily everyone's gathering together to worship. And even the food is a form of worship. Even eating itself is a form of worship. Because we're happy in God's kingdom, so to speak. I mean, it's really... So So the idea here that the Noah can learn from, the idea is, is, is that even when you're elsewhere, and we'll find other times King David talks about this idea. Even in this chapter, he talks about this, that even he was busy doing other things, he wanted to go to the house of study. In other words, there's a yearning to be in intimate relationship with God. There's a yearning to get away from the mundane physical matters and to return to, to Torah study and prayer and to be in that intimate relationship with the Almighty. And so that's a, that's a form of Sabbath, which even a Bnei Noach can have. Okay. And so when you yearn for it, that's a special quality that, that first of all, brings you closer to it, because when it feels closer and more precious to you, it actually becomes more meaningful, more powerful. But it also brings it into your whole week. As the Baal Shem Tov taught, we are where, we, where our thoughts are. 
So when a person thinks is as uh, thinks about the moments that you know, you know by his book, you know, you're thinking that you have your book of I don't know, maybe you have your chumash, some ways your chumash, you know, you have your little corner in your house with your book there, and you're thinking. What a nice time I had in the morning. I like this evening. I'm waiting for when I can go back and sit there with my tea and I'm going to open up my books again or maybe I'll have a lecture with the, with the rabbi that I'll be listening to you know, soon. And it's, it's a, The point is it should be a precious moment to you, a precious time that you remember that, that you, you're looking forward when you'll be there again. You know, it's kind of like when a person has a time with their, their beloved, whether it's their spouse, it's their child. And then, they, you know, this few minutes maybe that they can spend just talking together and how meaningful that is. This is also this is a time with God as an intimate time that you can sit with him and then God speaks to you and gives his, you his, his great wisdom. And even, even beyond the wisdom, just the intimacy with him. So that's the idea. With all, with all their heart, they seek, and they seek him out. That's the idea of that. Okay. Um, I was thinking how long we should do this introduction if we should maybe just jump in because um, it's very it's very long and we kind of get the idea a little bit the point that he's making is that there's a form of wisdom that has not been paid enough attention to that he wants to expose us to and he wants that we should learn it really, really well. So I don't know if you have the book, but he talks about this, for example, like on page 10. We see on page 10, it's actually in the, in the English, the English is page 11. That's how I have it in my, in my book. So... In the Duties of the Heart, the Feldheim version, introduction, page 11, he says, I examined these writings and did not find among them a book devoted to the knowledge of the inward life. I found this field, the knowledge of the duties of the heart, to be neg a neglected one. No one had ever written a book about its foundations. So this is really the key point. You know, he's, he's talking about here about all the different types of wisdoms and, 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 um, uh, What's the word? And the different uh, studies, you know. And he found, even within Torah, that this particular subject matter was not really focused on. There was no, and there was no work that was written about it in depth. And he said, I have to do something about this, right? Then he says, this came as a great shock to me. And I began to wonder, perhaps these duties are not. Anyway, he goes on to say that, you know, so he, so he thought to himself, well, well, maybe it's not as a big a deal as I thought, because otherwise someone wouldn't have written a book. And then he goes on to say, no, 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 that's not the case. This is actually the most important thing. And for some strange reason, some reason, he's like basically the most important point of all, the very foundation. No one has written a book about it. I have to do I have to be I have to write it. I have to write the book. So this actually is very, very interesting. Um, let's see. Maybe we'll do this here. All right. Let me see some things that, that maybe we should just do quickly. So on page, going back and forth a little bit, on page seven, he talks, explains this distinction. Um, he says, the wisdom of the Torah can be divided into two parts. Knowledge of the duties of the limbs, i.e. wisdom that is manifested externally, and knowledge of the duties of the heart, duties which belong to the hidden private realm of the heart. It is wisdom of the inner life. And then he explains that. He explains that. I don't know if we have to really get into that because that's something that's a separate topic. So we go on to the next paragraph there, on page 7, bottom paragraph. It says, all of the commandments are either positive or negative. There is no need to explain this in regards to the commandments that involve the limbs, so they are known by all. I'll mention, however, a few of the positive and negative commandments which occurred to me from among the duties of the heart. These will then serve as example to all the rest. So this is important. Let's get to this. Examples of positive commandments from among the duties of the heart are 
to believe that the world has a creator. One. Two, who, uh, who, okay, who brought into it into existence from non-existence. So this is a very important point, very, very important point, um, which I think in a certain sense, hey, there we are, okay, is something that that even those who are monotheists don't necessarily believe. But I, I think everyone in this room gets this already, so I won't spend too much time on it. But the idea that you can say that God created the world and not necessarily realize that that means God created being itself. That be without God, there's just nothingness. In other words, a person could think there's one God who magically popped things into, into being. In other words, is God a magician who like spoke and then things came about, which is kind of like something from something? Or there was just nothing. There wasn't even an idea. There wasn't, there was, I mean, it's even hard to really fathom that far. There was no, there wasn't even, the, not only there was nothing physical, there wasn't an idea, there wasn't an emotion, there wasn't that, there wasn't space, there wasn't time, there wasn't, there was nothing. Nothing defined as we know it existed. And God made all those things. So, I mean, everyone in this room knows this already, but I'm just bringing it out that, because I think in other religions it may not be so clear to everybody in, in the other monotheistic religions that this is this is an I this is not uh, for example I, I I may be wrong about but this idea this distinction I don't want to talk really too much about it but like uh, let's just talk about like a, God is a ghost I mean the idea of a ghost itself is like uh, a ghost is a being it's a defined thing I don't really know much about the Christian ideas about it but I just know the wording to call God, you know, part of this three thing is as, as a, a holy ghost. The idea of a ghost itself is problematic because that's a defined existence. So that itself is, does not jive with Judaism or what our author just said. I Meaning to say God created all, all existence from non-existence, which means, in a certain sense, from God, God is, is both an existence himself and a non-existence. That makes any sense. Meaning to say God is even before existence. Meaning to say God is before any definition whatsoever, which is impossible for us to fathom. Can't understand what that means, but and that's the problem. A ghost is something we can understand. It's like, uh, what was that show when I was a kid? Uh, I forgot the name of it, but the ghost, he's like, uh, he's like a cloud. He's like a cloud of mist. You know, I forgot the name of this cartoon with a ghost in it, but... To, you get the idea. The point is that's that's a, def, a fine, it has some definition. And that, that's a problem already. So to say God is a ghost, that's it. Thank you, Casper the Friendly Ghost. That's the one. Yeah, I forgot the name. So so the point is that the idea that 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 uh you know a monotheistic religion can call you know the God of the Bible a ghost is showing they don't understand what they're talking about. They don't understand what God is, and then they're miss then they're missing it. Then there's something that then God is already a creature, so they're missing. He's defined. He has something. He's like uh he's like the air. He's he's just not a physical like a like a body, like but he does. But he's uh he's uh, he still has definition, and that's that. Then he's that's not him either. The only thing we can say about him is we can describe his attributes, right? We can't say what he is. And by saying a ghost, you're saying you're defining his being. And that is impossible. That's that's heresy. That itself is heresy. That itself is wrong. Only the soul really, the soul understands God. When we talk about God, we mention his name and you feel a little inspiration because the soul inside knows what you're talking about. But the human mind, the physical, cannot, doesn't know anything. And even then, we don't really know. Even the soul doesn't know. The angels only know of his glory, right? They said, where is the place of his glory? Where is the source of his glory? They're asking because, it is as if to say, where is it? It's so it's so beyond them that they have to ask where it is, right? And the, I'm talking about in the Jewish prayer book. There are certain verses that talk about that the angels and the, the seraphim were asking, where is the place of the source of his, in other words, the place of his glory? Blessed be the place of, right? Blessed be the glory of 
Blessed and powerful. Blessed be the, the glory of God from his place, from its source. I mean, this is mysterious words. I mean, it's like a circle. Where is it? It's from his place where it's from. Where, but that just goes to show you how, how you know, hidden the whole thing is. Even the angels don't really, can't express it. Where exactly and what. All right. Anyway, back to this point. I don't know why. I, okay. Because we were talking, yes. We were talking about. Where am I on this page here? Oh, yeah. So I was on page eight on the top. We're talking about different duties of the heart. And we said that God, first of all, that not believing he's the creator who brought into existence everything from non-existence and that there's none like him and then to acknowledge his unity, that he's completely one. Again, that has a little bit to do with being non-defined, as I said, but he's not made of parts, completely one. Completely a oneness, completely without definition, completely infinite. To serve him in one's heart, to contemplate the wonders of his creations, and gain evidence of his existence. So here you see something interesting also. So he's saying that a person has an obligation to contemplate God's wonders, and also to gain evidence of his existence. You see, this shows you that our author believed that there was a commandment of the Torah, a person has to seek proofs of God. It's, very, it's controversial. Not everybody agrees with that. A lot of Eastern, Eastern European Jewish rabbinic tradition was not in favor of that. But, but our, our <clears throat> author's position is that a person should try to rationally bring proofs for God's existence, and that's part of your responsibility to bring God down to yourself, that you should understand him. And, and we can't understand him, you know, we have to also understand his, his proof of his existence the best we can. Then he says to put one's trust in him, to be humble before him, to be in awe of him, and afraid and ashamed, because both our public and private selves are known to him. So these are all, he says, these are all things that a person is what? He says they're all commands, commandments. He's talking, he's listing positive commandments, commandments. They're not like advice. I think it's fascinating because, you know, I don't know. I mean, think about your Judaism classes, okay? I don't, I mean, I don't know. But how many people have said that you're obligated to do these things? You have to, you're commanded to do these things? He's right, but it's not talked about it. Like so, so much. I mean, obviously, is right. I mean, who am I to say he, to, to talk to as if the author doesn't need need my, you know, recommendation? But the point is, is that it's it's an important and profound point to bring out that these aren't just things like for the pious, for special people. You think that being humble before God, putting all your trust in Him, being in awe of Him, this is like for you know the unique. This is for the upper class, the most pious, the most religious, the most, you know, greatest scholars, the people who are sitting in the toast. No, this is for everybody. He's saying this is a commandment that goes on every Israelite. And the truth is, these are things that are general ideas that relate to all human beings. They're, they're rational things that have to do with a person's relationship with God that should apply to everybody. So that's quite interesting. This is an obligation. That, that means a person has to work on getting it done, making sure that they, they are doing these things. Where He points it out simply that to be in awe on him, they're afraid and ashamed because both our public and private selves are known to him. Yeah, I have to say, it's true, like when you're standing in the, in the standing prayer, it's kind of, you can feel a little embarrassing. It's a little embarrassing. You know, like all our blemishes are known and, you, you know, you, you're standing before God. To long to do his will. To long, long to do it. Not just to be willing to do it, take on the yoke, but to long to do it. Wow. To let all that, to let all that one does be for his sake. To love him and those devoted to him so as to become close to him. And hate those who are his enemies and other similar duties. Okay. 
So those are the positive commandments. Then he gives examples of negative ones, right? Examples of negative commandments from among the duties of the heart are the opposites of the above also. So they're the opposites of the above. In other words, not to hate him, not to not to lack awe of him, I guess. Not to anyway, those the, the positive negatives are just the alter egos of the positives. Then he gives some extra uh, points, he makes some extra points. Not to be envious, revengeful, or grudging with people. Those are also duties of the heart. Not to dwell on sin, meaning not to think about sins, not to desire them or decide to do them. In similar matters of conscience, which only the Creator knows of, and as is written, I, God, search the heart and test the mind. Jeremiah 17. The soul of man is a lamp of God, searching all his inmost parts. And it comes from Mishle, which is an English Proverbs. All right. So he's pointing out that there are commandments of the Bible, of the Torah, which are really inner, which have to do with feelings, have to do with beliefs, have to do with love and fear, have to do with our understanding and perceptions. They're not doing. There's an idea out there that Judaism is just about action. That's not true. That's what he's, That's exactly his point. Because, because the Talmud takes up so much of its folios with the minutia of, of halachic action, so people can get their idea that that's what Judaism is. But that is wrong. That is, of course, an important part of it, but there's more than one part. It's a necessary part. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I always come back to so often the example of a marriage, but... You know, there are two elements of marriage. I mean, people need to work together. They also need to actually love each other. I mean, if you have one without the other, either one, you don't have a good marriage. I mean, you know, it, you need both. You can't say, well, you know, look, I bring home the bread, so that's enough. Yeah, but if you don't really love your wife, then it's still a big problem. I mean, vice versa. If a person, you know, the woman is... Uh, and the same thing the other way around. Well, I love you so much, but I just abuse you, but I love you so much. That's not good enough. I mean, a person, uh, I love you so much, but your wife's been asking you, you know, for years to take out the garbage and you just don't do it. That's not so nice. So, <laughs> that's just one example, but you see what I'm saying. Um, so we need both, and obviously one reflects on the other because a person who really loves, I think, more the other way. The duties of the, the duties of the heart. How do I say? Like, okay, if a person is very meticulous in, in the way they keep the, the law, it should flow from their love of God. I mean, this is something it says in Tanya. The true impetus for carrying out the law should be. Because a person wants to cleave to God, and the way to do so is through the commandments. Or you could say it in a more simple way, uh, in terms of relationship, not so, not, not, so, not without such a mystical approach. A person knows this is what God wants. When you love someone, you want to do what they want. You want them to be happy with you. And so you do it. That's another approach. But the, the, the Hasidic approach is the point is you know God uh, dwells within the commandments, and by doing them, you're close to him, and so you want to perform them. And also the opposite, a person knows that if they, they, they violate any of the transgressions, that that creates a terrible distance, and uh, they're afraid of coming to do that. They're afraid of going against God's will. Who knows what that could lead to? And that's also actually quite important, because of a person, because unfortunately, a person's desires and everything, we need a, we need a big bowl of cold water poured over our head. And what is that bowl of cold water? When a person reads the Shema daily, and he comes to the verse that says that be careful, lest, lest you, you veer away, lest your heart leads you astray, and, and, and God becomes angry with you, and, uh, and, you know, the, and, and it doesn't rain, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and finally, and you're destroyed, you read those words, you should get a little shaken up. I heard a very good explanation about, about this whole thing, like about punishment. Why does God talk about punishment? Well, just, just I mean, 
it's it's on one foot and maybe it does reflect me getting off topic. So I'm not going to spend much time in it. And it's getting late. It is late. You know, it's a little late. It's not really so much the time, but, but I'll just say in one word, it's about truth. It's about being an adult. I mean, we have to know the, the serious repercussions of our actions. It's not about threatening and scaring people and, and, and you know, controlling people. But we have to understand the seriousness of life without knowing the seriousness of life that that's a problem. The example, uh, it was, I saw this in a video from Rabbi Manus Friedman. It was a very, very smart video. Everybody, if you haven't seen anything by him, you should check it out because he's very good. Um, but he talks about the idea of God's punishment similar to a seatbelt. He's like, he basically says, you know, when you go to your driver's ed, you see this video, they often show you like uh, horrible things that people were in terrible accidents because they didn't have their seatbelt on. So he says, look, if you go around in life always fearful about the seatbelt, I mean, you're never going to drive. I mean, you can't even get into your car. Let her... <laughs> the idea of the video is simply to make it, st- you should be serious. You should behave in a serious, responsible manner, but not get so terrified that you can't get in your car. And so that's his point to it. The idea of Judaism is that a person should live life, but live seriously. You know, a person should live and be full of vitality, but at the same time, know that it's also something of deep meaning and, 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 and weight. And we have to approach it as mature, with maturity. So 